So I was, didn't want to be an academic exactly, and I didn't want to be just a reporter. I am using devices of fiction to make my nonfiction come alive. And so one of them is that I am in the narrative. Um, and we can do that. Uh, we want, in the personal essay, we want to hear the voice of the writer. Um, we want to hear their, um, their perspective and, and their senses. chatting with Catherine Alto. She is a teacher, a speaker, a historian, a designer and a New York Times best-selling author. And Catherine also teaches a range of narrative non-fiction courses both online and in person and this is where we're going to be focusing for today's conversation. Hello Catherine, thanks so much for coming. Thanks Gabriella, it's lovely to be here with you. I thought before we dived into the specifics around narrative nonfiction, it would be really lovely to get a sense of what has led you to where you are today. You've written three books, you're working on your fourth, your essays have been published in a multitude of places, you've appeared on TV, you've appeared on film. So can you give us a bit of insight into what has guided and shaped your career? Sure. Well, places have always shaped my career and family. So people and places, I suppose, and plants. I grew up in the Central Valley in California uh, with a father who was a teacher of agriculture uh, and a garden designer and um, a mom who is, who is a nurse still. Um, and so I have my father's green eyes and green thumb, you could say. So I grew up gardening next to him and really enjoying it and loving it. Um, and the Central Valley is hundreds of miles long and a couple hundred miles wide, and it's considered the breadbasket of the world. It is filled with uh, orchards, and it's very linear, and nothing feels really natural. It felt very natural when I was growing up, but when I went to Berkeley and read essays by John Muir about what this Central Valley used to look like, he wrote some wonderful essays about walking from San Francisco to the Sierras. And when I read those, I realized I loved learning about what the natural world, what our world used to look like, but I liked it through the personal essay. And I especially like essays written with the writer on foot. So um, I ended up um, becoming what you call sort of an Americanist, studying Henry David Thoreau and writers of the American Renaissance. I didn't, I like academic writing, and I've uh, presented papers at the paper a paper at the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, but I also have a, a background in journalism too. So, but I wanted my journalism to work harder. So I was didn't want to be an academic exactly, and I didn't want to be just a reporter. And so I've struck a balance where in my creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction or literary journalism, whichever you want to call it. Um, Creative nonfiction is really the most prominent term, but I like narrative because it's uh, alliterative. Um, I am using devices of fiction to make my nonfiction come alive. And so one of them is that I am in the narrative. Um, and we can do that. Uh, we want, in the personal essay, we want to hear the voice of the writer. Um, we want to hear their um, their perspective and, and their senses. and. Um, uh, so that's where it it was born. It was born from the people, plants, and places where where I was raised, and um, and um, I have gone on to become, uh, as you mentioned, an author and an essayist. I really I really think of myself as a letter writer. Really, I'm writing letters to friends because um, mm. I was an ardent letter writer when I was a child. Um, some of my most vivid memories are cycling my bike across my small hometown with uh, and, and to the post office and I had 13 pen pals when I was 13 I remember that fig those figures um, and so I have adopted I have retained not adopted uh, that same confessional honest vulnerable openness that you get in letter writing as I do in my essays and it just so happened that my essays uh, get strung together into chapters and books. And so um, that accessible nature of my writing is, is, is really born from, again, going back to my childhood and wanting to um, feel like I'm talking to a friend and want 
and it's also easier to write that way. If my students have issues with beginning to write, I just say, well, why don't you imagine writing a letter to a friend, you know, and that's yeah. kind of how it works. Um, but yeah, that mm. gives me just some very basic origin stories. Yeah. I love that because it really makes me think, Catherine, when you're talking about your father and the design and the gardening, like the green finger and the green eye, but then when you were studying and you were really enjoying these essays about how nature used to look, it really makes me think of the difference between taking various ingredients of inspiration and making your own career dish versus following in someone's footsteps in a niche that they've already carved out for themselves. I also was raised in a very... People put up with my playfulness. No one said, don't do something. Don't do this or don't do that. And so I was talking about this the other day in my uh, class called Progress Not Perfection, creating an intentional writing practice. And and um, it's interesting listening to some of my students who had people in their lives when they were young who, who didn't allow them to play. And so this playfulness on the page, on the stage, with crayons when I'm designing a landscape. It's just sort of always I feel very, um, I could just, whatever I dream I, about doing, I, I don't have many stops to it. And so that lets me, you feel me on the page that way. You, you f f sense me when I'm speaking that I, I break the fourth wall and I, um, I create scenes that way and I'm just very at home, you know, that yeah. in, in all those different ways. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I not it. at home, say, in a statistics class. I don't <laughs> like statistics. I shut it off. <laughs> but but I, we all have our niches, you know, and I've, I've leaned into mine heavily. Yeah. Yeah. I thought for the conversation it would be useful to create a narrative arc. So someone watching this has a sense of the journey that we're going to mm -hmm. take. So my plan, let's see if I can stick to it or like not get distracted and go off on a tangent is to start with almost that pre idea moment where inspiration is like pre verbal it, and it's more just that felt sense of something wanting to come through. Then we can explore the writing process where we take that felt sense or that creative urge and begin to put words to it. And then hopefully ending with a coherent idea slash book slash book proposal so we really take that full journey let's see how we let's see how we go okay so I guess right at the beginning this is certainly the impression I have with the people that I'm working and chatting with that it can be and certainly my own experience too it's easy to struggle at that point where we've got a desire to write something yet we don't fully know what it is yet and I think the brain is so, it so wants to know, it so wants to know where it's going and it can really make us fearful. So how would you hold space for someone, Catherine, who's like, oh, I really want to write something, but I don't really know what it is. It's funny because I, when you were speaking, I reached over and I grabbed my copy of The Creative Act, A Way of Being mm. by Rick Rubin. And we just finished reading and discussing the book in the class that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So all of these ideas should be fresh in my mind, and yet I was reaching for the book uh, just because I've, I've taught a few classes in the last few days. And, you know, I, th I think that, as Rick Rubin says, we're all, we're all creative, and, and, but in different ways, you know? And I think that trusting that sort of that glimmer, you know, what, what, what stays with you and comes back again, you know, um, again and again and, and again. And I think that um, we don't want to imitate other people. We don't, we, and we need to, and I think for some of us, we, some of us can trust our intuition. Some of us are, are overly analytical. Some of us sabotage ourselves. Some of us don't trust something might pass through us and maybe it sticks a little bit, and maybe it stays with us. It's those ideas that stay with us for a long time that we should trust. For example, I applied for a very prominent fellowship in the United States a couple months ago, and I can't, I don't really like to talk about my ideas because I, I, I jinx them, but it's something that, it goes back to 
the origins uh, of something that I just said to you a few minutes ago about my origin story. You can see I'm talking around it. And I will not reveal it uh, just because I'm like, I cannot jinx it. But yeah, yeah. it has to go back to a way of an old fashioned way of communicating and being in the world. So for me, and your listeners will have different takes on this, but for me, I'm always thinking about how does the part relate to the whole? Like, I can write on my own in the morning. I do that most mornings. I Behind me, I have a, a space where I don't allow any of the outside world in. It's a very internal space. And this is my external space where I interface with people and use words like interface. Um, and um, But in, in, uh, in that space, I, um, I, I allow ideas to come to me and I begin to think, um, how, how, again, how does the part relate to the whole? So I'm always thinking, for me to write something and uh, write a proposal about something, not just write on my own in that office, in that space. I don't want to call it an office, um, cavern. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it needs to. How does the how does the personal relate to the universal? So I'm always thinking, how does my story die? I use a term called dilation in, in my teaching. How, what resonance does this idea have? Not only about myself, if it's just about myself, I'm navel gazing. And that's fine. If I am just personal journaling or I'm exploring my own self. But when I'm writing, it is something that's going to be public. It's going to be art. It's going to be artificial. It's going to be possibly because of who I am, a commentary on how we live today. So, um, so this idea that has been germinating for a long time, um, I realize that now is the time for it to come out. Because now we are, we are things, the way we think now can be easily interrupted by AI. And we live in a very fast-paced culture right now, too. And I like slow, old ways of being in the world, of communicating with ourselves, with others. Um, and so it finally snapped together. I had a deadline in front of me for this uh, fellowship, and I thought, and only 3% of people get the fellowship. So I am not even thinking that it's going to happen. But the point is to apply for something because it will really force you to crystallize your ideas. Mm. So for me, personally, um, it has to sit there for a long time. It's got to have a parallel narrative. It's got to be about something bigger. Um, and, that's, and that's how I decide to take something personal that's been germinating and decide it's time that it's worthy of a book proposal. It's worthy of a query letter. It's worthy of a fellowship. It's worthy of a residency or something like that. Um, so this is, this is not to say that I don't think about things that don't have a commercial value. I, this is what this other room is. It's my own space where I can evolve and grow and play. It's got calligraphy pens in there. It's got watercolor paints and charcoals and uh, all, all sorts of um, fun places, fun things to play with. Um, but when I'm thinking about writing an essay or a book, then I am thinking, how does this, how, do, how why would this particular publication want to publish it? Because it's a, it's a business proposal. You know, these mm -hmm. presses and publishers are not there to support play. They're there to, you know, they have to make money. But you want to retain that sense of play in, in the creation of this piece of art. But also it has to be, it, there's got to be this resonance. How does the part relate to the whole? So I'm, I'm, I begin, once I, once I pivot to that stage, then I'm ready to, to make it go public, as it were, you know. Yeah, and that's so great to get that sense of, I think it was trusting the glimmers. I haven't read Rick Rubin's book and the, the What Stays With You. So it's almost like trusting the process to be with that, but then at the right point to start asking the question, how does this cease to be navel gazing and how does it, how's it gonna apply? And you kind of touched on something else, Catherine, that I want to dive into, which is, so we've got, okay, we've got the, the urge developing, we're allowing that, we're giving it space, we're allowing time to play, but we're also allowing time for it to become a bit of a business proposal. In terms of mindset and self-expression, and I know that you're brilliantly qualified to talk about this, 
I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on a predicament that I see quite often, which is this ironic tension between this deep urge to express yourself, which seems to, with some people, come hand in hand with a dread of doing that very thing. What do you make of that? I think that writing is thinking, or any art is thinking, writing in particular is thinking about, and you're putting your ideas down in words, and I think, I think there's a, f for some people who are very, very talented, who can be very, very talented, um, there's a fear that something they hold so close to their hearts might not be valued by other people and they'd ra as much, and they'd rather just hold on to it. You know, I tell my students, you know, when I go to bookstores and um, libraries and I see I'm surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of books, well, those are books that have had struggles behind them. Those people have often have help, mentors, editors, publishers, and you see the physical manifestation of a lot of work of someone believing in an idea that each one of those books has a narrative arc, as you mentioned earlier, and a backstory. But there's another library and another bookstore that exists that is a billion times bigger than that, and that is what I tell my students is the invisible bookstore, and it exists in the minds of them, uh, and it is the one where all, everyone's got a book to write, but it's taking the leap and saying, I need help. I need, because books are collaborative. It's not something, there's this idea that, you know, we're tortured artists and we work on an island in the middle of the ocean somewhere, a lighthouse or something. It's not. Um, I mean, there are periods of time when you need that. I, and that time period as an extrovert would drives me crazy. So I have to be very disciplined about having my my breaks and my social time, but you need that deep diving. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that um, that it's that it's really important to realize that it's collaborative, that it's important to reach out, um, and often for people who are really busy, a lot of busy people have really creative ideas. You know, mm -hmm. it's like. Every single person in all of my courses is very busy. They're professors, they are um, perhaps newly retired, but they have a billion projects that they're doing. Perhaps they have families and they're you know, a, a working as well. But they, they know that if they didn't cultivate the artists within them, that they would live with the void of not cultivating that part. Um, and that is harder than just doing it. And having deadlines is one of the most important things too. And having a community. So for example, in my courses, which are all online, unless I'm on a book a speaking tour and I'm speaking in different places, the distance between time zones, I have people in Pakistan and Kenya and India and all over Europe and the British Isles and all across the United States and sometimes in South America as well and right now in South Africa. Um, so you have an amazing classroom and no matter where people are, in fact the other day in one class someone was in Milan, Italy, another person was in South Africa, another was left Prague and was back in New York City and another person, just of many, were, was in, uh, in uh, uh, England. And despite all of that, they're helping each other because they all have deadlines and they're all in workshop groups together where they care about helping each other and mm -hmm. they um, read each other's work. And it's, a, it's an incredible space. So I would say, you know, finding a community where people are struggling like you are and you see the triumphs, you see the struggles, and you see people get it done. People get it done. Um, mm. And I was, I was mentioning earlier, one of my students was shortlist, longlisted for the Wild Muse Prize and recently. And yeah. um, she's busy and yet she did it. You know, mm -hmm. it's a struggle. And to see, so for every person I work with, um, I'm able, very few people don't struggle. It's normal to struggle. It's normal to have self-doubt. Uh, in fact, one of my mentees is, uh, in, uh, is a musician in Nashville. And between the third session and the fourth session, the third session, he was really struggling. And he just gave me about 20 pages of throwing ideas on the, on the page. And he's a songwriter, he's creative, and he, he knew that it would lead to something else. And then I said, all right, I gave him something that I'd written. I said, copy it. 
copy it. It was a proposal for a fellowship. And he did, and he embellished it. He went beyond, and it's the best thing. He made a huge leap. So he went from despair to, okay, there's a little bit of vision. Let me try. And I see him on the way to having a book proposal written, and it's a brilliant idea, but sometimes we just need help along the way. And it's totally mm. normal for help. There's a misconception that, you know, I mean, there are some people who are innately talented. Like, I have my unique weird traits. Like I'm a very musical writer. I, 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 I really am attuned and I've been this way since I was a child to cadence and rhythm and sounds and almost like pro, uh, 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 almost like writing poetry. I'm, I'm real. in fact, I have to dial it down because I have to remember, I have to tell myself, you're a prose writer, remember? Um, you don't need to link all these vowels together. You don't, have <laughs> I tend to do that. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's um, you know uh, having people around to uh, that we all have we all have our strengths and we're not born artists. Some of us have our like I said our our little quirks and things that we're especially good at. But it is work, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a phrase I think Hemingway said it: "Writing is easy. All you do is sit at a typewriter and bleed." You know. Mm, yeah. And actually, what's striking me. Catherine, is what you're saying, if we go right back to the beginning when you shared that someone has that something close to their heart and they're then imagining putting it out there, giving it words and thinking, I, I no one's going to value it as much as me. But of course, when you're in community, that's what's so beautiful about having that safe space. You know, you said your playfulness was championed. But if we've grown up sharing what's in our heart and it not being championed, how healing to find ourselves in a community where what we then share and to take your songwriter, they could have sort of stayed at that blocked place. But to put that 20 pages together, like that's the next step, isn't it? You you put it out there and it's not rejected. It's held, it's nurtured and it, it really rewires the whole experience. Rewiring the experience is really a good term right there. And that's what happens in the in any community, in really well managed communities, I would say, artistic mm. communities. Um, and 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 sometimes we just need an extra, maybe it could be a fellow student, maybe it could be a mentor, reaching out to a mentor, maybe it could be just talking it through with a friend. Um, but it's sometimes, you know, having that helping hand at crucial points, because I see crucial points when people give up. And, yeah. you know, a big part of my job when I'm in teacher mode is helping people grow technically as narrative nonfiction writers, whether they're focusing on nature writing or memoir or food writing or personal essay. And, and, and also cheerleading them, you know, like there's a psychological aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. Some people want to write just for, they don't want their writing to go public. And that is absolutely valid. It is a part of a private creative practice. And um, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and they learn different disciplines and different ways, you know, and, and um, ways of being on the, on the page. Some people want to go public, you know, and then your art becomes, it steps away from, it really becomes a different little beastie because it's performative in a way, you yes. know, and it yeah. needs to engage. So it's that kind of writing does, has different, a diff, it, different, it's doing something slightly different. You know. Yeah. And also, I imagine the stakes are different because if it's just for you, there isn't that fear of how it's going to be received, where the, if it's performative and perhaps there's been some history about performative stuff not going that well, then there can be some real stakes there too. Let's take the Substack writer because I know a lot of people who are going to be watching this will be uh, writing posts, essays, sharing content on Substack. So we've moved from, I want to write, but I don't know what I want to write about. So we've taken note of the glimmers. We've really been observant as to what's staying with, with us. We're sensing what's the wider appeal of this idea. So they want to be posting regularly. It might be that they want to be writing an essay a week, let's say, or, or, or an essay a fortnight. And they've got the few areas of interest that they want to discuss, but perhaps 
they're not sure about what step to take because this whole Substack enterprise is going to be lasting for a while. So if someone were finding their feet as an essay writer and wanting to sort of really carve out a niche so that people start to get to know them as, ah, oh, this is a person who's often talking about these subject areas. So imagine you had a client talking to you about that. How would you then guide them? We need to be good storytellers. Number one, we need to know the techniques of what we're doing. We need to understand the science of storytelling uh, and how to capture curiosities. I mean, the science of storytelling is rooted in the a basic question of positing a curiosity and the reader needs to want to know what happens next. What happens next? It's not, if it's uh, all facts, then it's a list. I would say for Substack, maybe you need to think about, okay, what's the narrative arc over the next month, six months, year? What kind of story do I want to tell? And it's and one of the worst things you can do as a writer is go right to your keyboard and start and start posting. Mm. I think it's really important to pull back and think of our own narrative arc as just individuals and artistic beings, but also the narrative arc of, an, of technically of what the art is we're putting out, but also the overall arc. So we've got layered arcs and we need to don't go to the keyboard and start pounding something out because you have to put something out and then it's not at a high quality. Um, this is not to say you shouldn't play, but if you're trying to achieve something where you maybe want more of a, uh, to increase your readership and you want people to constantly think, well, what's happening? What's going on there? Then you have to understand the science of storytelling. There's a whole pre-writing aspect as well, you know, mm -hmm. which is dreaming, mind mapping, outlining before we go to the keyboard. And I think we could talk about I mean, people can sabotage the process if they don't know. Again, it's all, you know, planning, pulling back from the urge to put something out there immediately. And you can see mm -hmm. my sensibilities about slowing down and really thinking uh, about the process and what we want. And again, this goes back to creating an intentional writing practice and bringing mindfulness to an intention to all these different layers of what we're doing. I think it would be lovely to get a sense of what the pillars are pre-writing perhaps and I don't know if you want if you're happy to share them all but seeing well, as we're at that kind of planning pre-writing what pillars have you got for that area? Well I wouldn't call I would say I have eight pill I would have I have eight pillars of narrative nonfiction that I can talk about mm. maybe before that as I referenced a moment ago there is a sort of stages that you go through when you're so you've gotten a glimmer of an idea right so we talked mm. about so we want to Hmm, it sits with us for a while. Maybe it comes up on our morning walks. Maybe it's something we think it comes up when we're in a shower or ironing and we're thinking about it again. So you want to think about recurring motifs um, and go to a notebook and just write, write, write them out. And, and um, mind map means just drop ideas out. You don't need to write complete sentences. That's for much later. Just drop your ideas in and put links. Well, if I think of this, this comes to mind and this comes to mind. So I would say mind mapping um, and then maybe putting some order to those with an outline maybe it's, or clustering things together. This seems to be related to food or something, or this is memoir and maybe this is a childhood part or this is something, well, hmm, there's something that happened in my teenage years, which might be I think that's got a narrative, good narrative. It's got a beginning, middle, and end to it. Maybe I'm going to focus on that, and then you flesh that out. So I would say you're seeing a little bit of that playfulness right there, you mm -hmm. know, um, much later. And then there's pre-writing uh, when we're thinking about scenes and we're thinking about those eight pillars uh, that I can talk about in a moment. But um, so. So that's what you're doing. You're thinking of snippets of dialogue. You're thinking of scenes. You're thinking of and then and then comes the technique you know would you like me to talk a little bit about that right now the eight pillars yeah I think the pillars would be great yeah okay Thanks so I uh, now I have 
So my courses are eight sessions long, eight, eight sessions, and in each they're two and a half hours. So for each one of these points, I focus on it for, for each okay. class. So I could talk for 22 and a half hours right now if we want. <laughs> we won't. I'm going to take it down. So I will just say, um, so the first thing is narrative presence. And I think for uh, people initially uh, who haven't written for a long time, they're not used to, they need someone to say, put yourself on the page, me, myself, and I, you are a character and you, you want your, you, your sensibilities, your background, your reflections, your musings are an important part. So you are a character. You can be on the page. We want to hear your voice. So number one, you can, now this is narrative nonfiction. So again, we're borrowing devices from fiction. Um, so put yourself on the page uh, and um, let yourself uh, be comfortable being a character. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is narrative arc, that all stories need a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's the beginning of the story that I recently focused on in a master class on, on structure, the architecture of a story. Um, and uh, so the beginning needs to bring in the science of storytelling. Of all the scenes that you have in this story that you want to tell, what is the one that will posit a curiosity and make the reader really want to read on? It might be the ending, which means you have to restructure your story in a different way. And some people think, oh no, chronological order is the only way I can write a story. And it's like, no, 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 no. There are at least a dozen ways to start a story. There's the hermit crab, reverse chronology, parallel narrative, narratives, um, thematic narratives, episodic narratives. Um, uh, there are many, many narrative structures, sorry, to tell a story. Um, so the order of the story, mm. um, that's really important. Yeah. Um, which is different than narrative arc, and I won't, I won't go structure is different than mm. narrative arc. A narrative arc is the outcome of a story. It could be rags to riches, riches to rags. Uh, uh, there are many, there are probably seven different kinds of, at least, sorry, different kinds of narrative arcs. So the mm -hmm. structure, the narrative arc is, 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 is never changes, but the, the, the order in which we tell the story can change. So I know that sounds technical for some of your listeners right now, but um, there you go. The third thing is, um, is uh, dialogue and monologue. There is nothing better than dropping a reader into a cinematic scene than a, di than a conversation between two people. So mm. I really... Uh, focus on dialogue in my in my courses and once people get it they get it and it is wonderful uh, um, to see it really come to life and and that is a really key thing the other thing is voice so we all have different literary fingerprints and signature writing styles and um, I would say that's the that's the one that takes the longest to develop um, you can't expect to take voice lessons for you know, uh, six, three, one, three months and maybe end up on the stage, at the, you know, at uh, the Met or Carnegie Hall, you know, you, it just takes a while. And I think in this fast age, people think, well, if I, if I don't get it in at the end of a course and I'm just not good enough. No, it's one of those mm -hmm. things. It just takes a while. I would say voice takes the longest to develop, just like it does in real life with the you know, sing, singing. Yeah. Um, the other thing, the fourth point is, um, sorry, fifth point. Fifth, yeah. Is uh, uh, language and language. the syntax, um, the, the figurative language, how we put words on the page, and each one of us does it in a different way. Uh, I am a, a lyrical essayist. I think about I think about sounds a lot. I'm, I'm quite poetic and just probably, in my view, overly. And I always have to dial it down because I'm I'm always linking and I'm always. <sighs> I love it. I love it. I just, when I get into that, I'm in a zone uh, and I, I absolutely love it. Um, so attention to language is, is another, another aspect. The um, sixth is, um, is character. When people end up on the page, they become a character, ourselves and other people. And it's going beyond physical characteristics. Um, we are writing about you know, when we see a, 
uh, an iceberg. We think of, we see the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. but 90% of the iceberg is below the surface. And so we as writers need to think what is below the surface of this person? What makes them tick? Who are they? And I think a lot of research allows us to become really empathetic with the people mm -hmm that we're profiling or people in our story. It's beyond the physical. And I'd like to say that once we gather information about somebody, uh, you know, we're thinking about them, it's part of this pre-writing, that um, um, we don't write like, well, like we're painting by numbers. You know, painting by numbers is very, one is yellow, two is green, you know, three is blue, and you paint very in a prescribed way. We don't. We don't want to. We don't want to put the whole person on the page, mm. like what they're wearing, the color. You know, it gets to be. The, let our brains don't work that way. Omission is really, really good. The reader's not dumb. The reader. You. You. If we overtell and we overwrite, you're denying the reader the joy of meaning making in their own way. Mm. And so John McPhee has written an essay called Omission on what to leave out. And uh, maybe your listeners would like to, to look that up. It's about dialing it back and taking a lot, uh, pruning. So That's what nice. I say, instead of, is, uh, instead of painting by numbers, do impressionistic broad strokes of people. Mm -hmm. And that way you let the reader, it's it, the most salient, interesting characteristics, but not everything so that people can use their imaginations. Um, Cause we're just creating worlds in our minds. Um, and then the seventh is setting, really paying attention to if we're writing phys about physical landscapes, which a lot of travel and nature writers do, then we're thinking about uh, a whole, whole different range of characteristics from um, our senses, you know, sound, sight, touch, texture, taste, hearing, um, to um, weather systems, ecosystems, knowing what we're looking at, naming things. So there's the outside place. And then there's also interior worlds as well. And I call those settings. So I, I call, I don't call setting outside a setting. I say it's a landscape or it's an eco, it's a place. Mm -hmm. But inside, we also need to be attentive to uh, describing interior worlds as well, maybe where a conversation is happening or where a scene is taking place. And then the very last thing is the eighth element or pillar is what I call dilation. And it's what I referred to earlier, but it's the how does the part relate to the whole? And you never want to say like at the end of your essay and reader, this is how I learned this from this period of life. No, 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 no. You don't want to do that. That's, you know, it's, you don't want to tell the reader that you want them to understand it um, as it drips through it. And the thing about narrative nonfiction is it's, we're showing a lot and we're telling. It's a lovely dance or pivot between showing and telling. And it's when we tell that we have moments to dilate and explain without being too overt um, uh, how the part relates to the whole. How does this story I'm telling relate to the zeitgeist? How does my story comment in some way upon the human condition or the, a the time that we're living in right now? And then the meaning making happens right mm. there. You know? And it really, that's the grounding moment, the rooting moment of like, aha. Uh -huh. And if it's done really well, it does, it gives what's called, um, uh, it, uh, Philip Lopate in his incredible book, The Art of the Personal Essay, he writes an incredible introduction, which I love. And he says, you know, it's that shiver of recognition when the reader, you know, we have moments when we look up from writing and we're, we're savoring something that the re writer has put on the page and we identify with it, or it's a really good metaphor. And it's like, oh, well, you know, I remember Annie Dillard's metaphors from decades ago. I re can remember things. And, and mind you, I have a journal and people should have journals too, where they write down and they, you know, we, we become our own teachers. We, we write down great metaphors we've heard or, or turns of phrases or moments of the shivers of recognition where the writer has done something and we look up and think that's me that's mm. me I feel that I love this as a road map Catherine that does that feels like the pillars feel creative mm -hmm. as well because 
One of the things I was thinking about is how sometimes we can be resistant to a formula. Like we've got this creative urge and it just wants to splatter on the four walls around and then we're trying to give it a formula and we can be quite resistant to that. But the way that you're describing each of the pillars, they seem to have a playfulness to them. They seem to have a real sense of actually expanding what's already there. One thing I'm curious, and, and I know this is something that I've seen on your website as well, this idea of the ethical responsibility. You touched on earlier about the difference between navel gazing and something that is going to have that broader appeal. What are your thoughts about the difference between writing that's cathartic versus writing that's impactful and inspiring? Because I, def you know, I love the writing on Substack and sometimes I'll read a piece and I'll think that's, v that's a piece that's very much cathartic for the writer. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it's a public piece, so they're writing it for public consumption and then I'll read another piece and I'll think, oh, that's having a completely different impact on me. That's rather than me just watching someone have an experience of pain say I'm now taking real impact and I'm being inspired by this so for someone who's like oh how do I know which is which how do I go from one to the other yeah well I, 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 I teach memoir and so a lot of times that cathartic state uh, um, writing is a vital stage in writing memoir but it's not the memoir so it is a stage of it, and it's helping put things on the paper. So for example, I sometimes get it, and I, I lecture about it, I say, there's cathartic writing, it's called pre-writing. So it is a stage before. So I am not a psychoanalyst, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not a psychologist, although in many ways I am, because of, because of I, I'm dealing with empathy and the psychologies of, uh, learning and the psychology of different characters and I, I think that's one of our jobs as writers is to is to encourage our readers to be empathetic with greater than human life and human life and the past and etc. So I would say that um, what I tell my memoirists is I'm not a psychologist and I can't respond to that that sort of cathartic writing because it's not crafted so I'm dealing as an artist. <clears throat> I'm dealing with craft. And, but I do say that that is a stage. And, and sometimes now what I do is I assign, let's get the pre-writing done. Let's show the difference between, let's do the pre-writing this week. Get it out. Now, what if you put all of that out there? Would a publisher want it? No. But it's revealed something to you about maybe the essence of the story. And so, that's why it's really important for, for writers not to go to a keyboard and think the cathartic and to misconstrue cathartic writing with writing. Writing, get the catharsis done, then step away from it. Mm -hmm. And think about all of the, the pillars that I mentioned. So for example, you don't try to do ev all of those eight pillars at once. For me and my students, I teach them in stages. You know, We read an essay, we talk about it, I lecture, uh, so my classes go lecture, discussion, workshopping. Um, so I talk about things and I pause a lot and they write and then we have a break and then we discuss the writing that was been assigned that week through the lens of that pillar that I'm trying to teach. And they see masterful essays um, that have been, for example, David, a David Sedaris essay. He's a masterful, one of the best uh, uh, writers of the personal essay, which is a genre in and of itself. Um, and he will draft 21 times for one essay. Um, and so the willingness to recognize pre-writing from writing, and once you have the writing, that it's got it, that the first couple drafts are figuring out what you think, what you, the first draft is seeing your writing on the page as something that is becoming art. And then you draft and redraft and collaborate and get feedback and put it away and come back to it again. Time is your best teacher, you know, because you're constantly having other life go on and then you look anew. Your revision means to look again. And so you want to constantly provide opportunities and space to put your writing away and then come back to it and go, oh, thank God if I'm not trying to get that published. <laughs> you know? With friends talking to me, they might be needed to, to be cathartic and talk to me about something and me with other people, but that's not, it's not art. 
So people need to recognize catharsis is different than art. Art requires an attention to technique and craft, time, uh, restraint, intention, mm. audience. There are lots of different techniques to think about. That's really helpful. Like for me in my mind, putting the cathartic writing into that category yeah. of pre-writing. Just that in itself, I think, is going to be super helpful for people. And then helping them understand that going from one to the next category of writing, that's when you start to introduce these elements of craft. Exactly. And that it's not... And to recognize what stage you're in. Like, okay, mm. now I'm, I'm burbling, I'm glimmering, I'm... Things are kind of... I'm being playful. I don't know. I'm. You don't have a question about that. Hmm. I'm going to follow it, and that's the sort of dreaming. You know, staring at going to a cafe and just sort of having a notebook open, or or just dreaming, and capturing those ideas. Because ideas are like butterflies. If you don't have net out to capture them, they're going to fly away. So, realizing you're in a dream, realizing it's the butterfly catching stage. Realizing, okay, all right, now I'm going to pre-write. I'm going to just put everything, I'm going to write and write and write for a half hour without my pen lifting. Mm. And then I'm going to think about editing, I'm go not editing, sorry, but pulling out different parts. That would make a good scene. That would make, that might be good dialogue. What? And then you realize through the lens of all these eight pillars that I need to pull this out. I'm going to develop this. And then you realize, okay, You've gone from having all of the ingredients in a cupboard and to mise en place. You know, if mise en, you have a different ingredients set out. Okay, mm. I might be ready to mix them together now, you know? <laughs> and then you begin to mix and you're like, well, that's an experiment, didn't work out. Then you do it maybe 21 times and you're like, look at this masterpiece. It's a 2,000 word essay and it's, it tastes really good, mm. you know? So it's that willingness to recognize what stage you're in and not give up between the stages and Again, communities really help because they are, you're outside your echo chamber and you get feedback. I might need to beg you to come back for a round two at some point, I but think. yeah, thank you. Thank but you. this has been a great, a great dive into some of the areas, really useful to have those pillars. I particularly love the omission, so I will put the link, I'll find the link for that essay that you mentioned as well. We'll put links, obviously people are going to be like, I want to find links for Catherine's courses, so I'll put those below as well. Thank you. Is there anything else, like just in terms of what we've chatted today, is there anything else you think, oh, I wish Gabriella had asked me this, or something that's just dropped in that you want to just finally share? Yeah, there, there are many quotes swirling in my head right now. I think um, I, I, I think one of the best things is, is, is just realizing what stage you're in and not being hard on yourself. That, you know, writing is hard work at times. And that if, just because it's, people might think, well, this is not intuitive. It's, bec it's okay if it's not intuitive. You're learning a new skill. And we live in an age, again, this theme of too much, we, if it doesn't come now, I'm, I must not be authentic and I'm not, oh, I'm not an artist. And you bang your head on a piano like one of those characters from Sesame Street, I'll never get it right. Um, it's not like that. Just, I think, I think be kind to yourself and just understanding the different phases is, is really vital. Mm, I love that as a takeaway because I think that can be a beautiful antidote to how the brain freaks out from this lack of certainty. At least if you know, well, I may not know exactly what it is I'm writing, but at least I know I'm in the pre-writing phase. That's that right. can be very comforting, I imagine. That's, that it is, it is. And that yeah. uh, you're, you, you, there's still hope. Leave hope. There's still hope. Leave hope. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And we connected on Instagram. So is that the best place for people to reach out or do you want them to reach out via your website? Oh, um, th th they're welcome to connect on Instagram. That's great. Um, my website's great as well. Um, but, um, you know, Instagram is, uh, you know, you get the, the flow of images and, and uh, goings on. And my courses are already announced. Are, um, uh, the courses start at the end of January, by the way, too. So, you know, for that, that's Perfect. some people might want to know that. But um, yeah, I'm, I, you, uh, I give writing tips, I give, if I've had a long teaching streak uh, and I want to talk about all the wonderful things my students have been up, up to and what we've learned that week and different speakers I've had in, I always talk about it on Instagram, so it's there. That's the best way to connect, I think. Perfect, I'll put that as well. 
Catherine, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Lovely to connect. Thank you.